Appreciate that singing. Appreciate everybody being with us. By the way, I cheated one of our members. Andrew actually came, I guess, the furthest. He came from up near College Side in Cookville. So he, and uh, they, they took a little harder hit up there than we did down here. So uh, we appreciate him being here. By the way, nobody had to come today. You know, anybody in here could have stayed at home and nobody would have thought any of the less of it because, you know, you could have easily just stayed home and said, well, folks will understand it's bad outside. So the fact that you're here is a real statement. Thanks for being here and, and sharing your faith with us as we study together. Um, I put this picture up to remind you to take your pets in when the weather's bad outside. Um, you know, these little guys aren't used to this cold weather, and so they, you need to bring them in, let them sleep by you on the couch where they can stay warm and comfy. So I know we, we brought our cat in, and, uh, and I know that you probably want to bring yours in too. Let me mention one other thing. We do have a lot of folks out. Uh, a lot of us social media, and that's great. I think it's great that we communicate with each other. Get word out to our members that couldn't be here, to your friends that couldn't get to church this morning. This lesson, probably within 24 to 36 hours, is going to be on YouTube, on our Cumberland Heights Church of Christ uh, uh, site. And so folks can uh, stay with it. And the reason I say that is because we're continuing our study of Acts this morning, or this afternoon. I keep saying morning, too, this afternoon. And so, you know, there are folks that won't want to miss that series, and so invite them. And a good, good way to invite your friends, too. So uh, just plug into that, if you would. Um, I, I am having a little fun with you with the cat picture, but uh, let's, let's uh, confess our common ground together, shall we? I'm a child of God. I'm saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. It's great that we can do that together. Let's stand as we read together a fairly short reading in Acts 4, verses 23 to 31. This is right after the trial of the apostles before the Jewish council. It says in Acts 4, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our, our father, your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. May God bless this great reading from his word. And his people said, Amen and amen. And we're not dismissing anybody for Children's Church because we're not having that on this unusual time schedule we're on. And so uh, let's just open our Bibles. If you aren't already in Acts 4, you might want to get there real quick as we continue our study. Uh, last week's lesson was entitled, Feeling the Heat. So I thought it would be interesting to entitle this lesson, Handling the Heat. Last week, we saw an example of them feeling it. This week, they go back home to their folks, and they say, all right, what are we going to do about this? We've been threatened. We've been told to be quiet. We've been told not to talk about Jesus anymore. What do you all think we ought to do? And so they, they, they're formulating a game plan here. And it's a pretty simple game plan, pretty obvious. It's one they follow all through the book of Acts. So as we set our stage for our lesson this morning, Let's think about this. Uh, Peter and John were put under arrest by the Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin. 
they were held overnight in jail and then they were taken to the council chamber the next morning in Jerusalem. And there they appeared before the 71 high leaders of the Jewish council. Uh, all dressed in their regalia, the leaders were, uh, all the pomp and circumstance and influence and power that resided in that place. And the, the, Peter and John had to be thinking in the back of their mind, this is what they did to Jesus a couple of months ago. I mean, it's been probably less than 60 days, Jesus stood before this same council in rather hostile circumstances. And uh, they no doubt knew the outcome of that. And they're probably thinking to themselves as they're brought in, rather roughly, uh, you know, is this where we're headed to? Are we going to now be called upon to die for Jesus? I think they were ready to do that if they had to, but it had to cross their mind. The council faces a dilemma because the apostles have performed a miracle that cannot, cannot be walked away from. The man was over 40 years old. He'd been crippled. He'd been lamed all of his life. He was never able to walk. His lower legs had never developed. And so he was just a, he was a pathetic person, laid at the entrance to the gates of the city for 40 years, begging from those that come and go to help support himself. Everybody in town knew him. No doubt many of the Jewish leaders had actually dropped money in his cup. They knew the guy. And they knew when they looked at They couldn't look at him and say, well, they must have brought you in from, so where'd you come from? They knew who he was. They also knew he couldn't walk. And now their eyes aren't lying to him. Because the Bible tells us earlier in this chapter, this man was standing beside Peter and John when they brought him in. So there he stands in all of his glory, well-developed legs, perfectly balanced. They've probably heard the stories of his dancing and his singing and his hopping around in the streets. They've heard the rumors that are going around from the people. And frankly, they're a little bit scared of these apostles. They're scared because these guys are in a position to cause them untold problems. Not only that, but they think of these apostles as being false teachers because they are preaching the resurrection of Jesus, something that the Sadducee leaders don't believe in. And so there's a dilemma here. They have a little confab. They decide what they're going to do is rough them up, kick them around a little bit, threaten them, send them out, tell them to keep their mouths shut and not talk about Jesus anymore. And that's where our story picks up because when you go to verse 23, what you have is upon their release from jail, what do they do? They go straight back to the church, the body of believers. There's, there's evidently a common ground meeting place that most of the disciples are known to kind of hang out with each other in the off hours. And, uh, and so the, the apostles just go straight to that place. What's interesting to me in the verses that follow is we have a powerful insight into early Christians. God again pulls back the shade and just gives us a snapshot. This is what early Christians looked like. This is how they handled conflict. This is how they dealt with persecution. This is how they related to each other. This is how they thought about God. This is how they prayed. Th these are the things that defined the spiritual internal workings of the church. And, you know, I look at that and I think, wow, that's where we need to be. And, you know, you always hear people say, well, that's first century. That's very different. It's not really that different. Christians are Christians. Converted sinners are converted sinners. Persecution's persecution. Preaching Jesus is preaching Jesus. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's simply looking at it and saying, okay, where can we, what can we take from this that makes us better as 21st century Christians following the first century faith of Peter and John? And so let's look at that and see what we can learn. And I see three truths that emerge out of this. And the first one is this. Believers place their church loyalty first. They put their relationship with fellow Christians at the top of their list. What did, what did Peter and John do the minute they got out of jail? 
It went straight to their brethren. In fact, look at the language. It says on their release, Peter and John went back to, listen to this, their own people. Do you catch that? That's clan language. That's clan language. You know? You live up, you live up in the hills somewhere, and, and you have a clan of folks that all live in an area, and when they leave town, you ask them where they're going. Well, I'm going back to be with my people. There was that sense of identity. I belong to these people. In fact, they had this sense of belonging to one another. It's talked about all through this book. These people realize they're in this together. They're all children of God. They've all been saved by grace. They all live each day by faith. And they all are willing to listen to the word of God. I think early Christians could, st could sit here this morning in our midst and confess what we just confessed together and be perfectly comfortable with it. They, they felt the same way. And it's the common ground that binds us all together. And it's, the, it's only the common ground that makes us survivable in the face of persecution. You know, you find that churches in areas outside of our country where the church is persecuted mercilessly, they don't have a lot of this interdenominational fighting and all of that kind of stuff that goes on. They don't have time for that. Their goal is to get to church and back without getting beat up, killed, or arrested. They don't worry about that other stuff. Now, I'm not saying that all the time it doesn't matter. But I'm saying that you've got to start with what early Christians started with, and that is us as one people called out of the world by Christ washed in the blood of the lamb saved of sins common sins we all have and on the road to heaven together and needing each other to get there and so that's a very important idea about this loyalty issue and the other thing that we find again and this is not the first last or only time you'll see it in Acts and we've noticed this haven't we what binds them together more than anything else they pray together all the time. They pray together. We're going to look at that prayer in a little more detail later on. But they pray together. That You know, they, they come in, and everybody welcomes them. They're patting them on the back. Boy, we're glad. We didn't expect to see you again. Yeah, God's been good to us. Well, what do you think we ought to do now? Well, I think we ought to have prayer. I think we ought to pray about it. You know, so many times when we start programs in the church, I don't know how I feel about programs because sometimes programs the word tends to take certain energy away from certain things. But when we start a program in the church, we sit down and we say, okay, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, let's make a list of potential volunteers. Let's set up a plan for how we're going to do it. Let's set up a timetable. Let's get our material together, do some background research. And after about 15 steps and maybe three or four months into the project, and somebody says, by the way, we ought to have a prayer about that. You know, just before we, before we run out the door with this thing, let's hit God real quick and say, Oh, Lord, God bless you. Help us with this. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Boom, we're out the door to do the important things. Not realizing that the moment we spent in prayer was the most important thing we could have done. It seems to me that everything the church does should not be accompanied by prayer. It should be preceded by prayer. It ought to be the first thing we do. Well, we have a problem. What are we going to do about it? Well, let's pray. Well, we're, we've got a lot of changes going on. How are we going to handle it? I think the first thing we ought to do is pray about it. Well, my doctor just told me I have cancer. What am I, what's, what am I going to do? What's the game plan? Game plan is let's pray about it. Let's do that first. That doesn't forego surgery, it doesn't forego treatment, doesn't forego all kinds of other things. But let's start where you're supposed to start. These folks got it. They preface, they precede everything they do with prayer. And they not only know how to ask God for help, they know how to thank Him for help too. I have no doubt that part of this prayer we don't actually have recorded for us because you know thanks was given. For the delivery of these two men. So you know you understand this idea of church loyalty. 
We're in it together. We pray about it together. We work it out together. And that's a beautiful thing that we learn from this early church. The second truth that we learn from these folks is that believers had a very clear understanding of who their God really was. And boy, this is something we have really dropped the ball on. We don't talk a lot in the church anymore about God. We don't talk about who God is. Somebody says, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I know what you have. God, God is omnipotent. God is, and we use all the big, long, fancy words. You know, we use all the theological terms to define God. I'm not talking about defining God. I'm talking about understanding God. Knowing who we work for. You know, one of the keys to being a successful employee is understanding what the boss wants. You know? You know what the boss wants and you anticipate, don't you? You know what the boss doesn't like. You stay away from those things. If you get any sense, if not, you have a very sordid employment history. You know? You show me a person that understands their boss real well, and I'll show you a person that's a successful employee. Same thing was true in the first century. If you were a servant, if you were a slave, and you served in the master's house, you had two choices. You learn your master well and know what your master wants and anticipate what your master wants you to do, or you bullheadedly go your own way and get beat every night. Now, how did early Christians define themselves? We're slaves of God. It would do us well to get to know our master a lot better. And they make three statements in this prayer that really are telling about their understanding. And by the way, I think we could take these three ideas and translate them, if you'll, if you'll stay with me for a minute as we look at them, we could go back into the book of Revelation and see all three of them underlying Revelation. I think you could take these three and put them underneath each of the letters of Paul. I think you could put them under all three underneath the book of Hebrews. I think you could put them underneath the theology of Romans. These are the three most fundamental concepts of God that drive early Christians in their faith toward God. Notice them with me. Look at verse 24. What is God called? What's the first thing he's called? Sovereign Lord. You know what the Greek word there is? Despotes. You know what a despot is? A despot is an absolute ruler who is not ever under any circumstance questioned. If he says to do it, you do it. You don't look up and say, well, I don't know about that. That's about as long as you're going to live right there. You don't argue. Now, I don't think the Bible is saying that God's a despot. I think understanding the strength of that word in defining who God is. He is sovereign. His word is absolute. It's like the old, like the old bumper sticker says, God says it, I accept it. That settles it. It's got to be that way. He says, sovereign God. And then what's the first thing he says about God? You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. God's the creator. Now, what, is that, what does that mean for us? Well, it's he who made us and we're not our own. Now, who's going to know my needs better than God? Who's going to give better advice to me than God? Who's going to lead me better through life than God? He created me. Jeremiah says God fashioned him in his mother's womb. He says, you knew me before I was born. And so early Christians understood their relationship to God. He's their maker. If he says, I want you to worship this way, that's the way you should worship. If he says, I want you to do this ministry, that's what you ought to be doing. Why? Who would know better than the maker? And so God is the maker. And again, you think about Revelation, you think about Romans, you think about, you know, Romans begins by saying God made us all so that even if you don't have the Bible, you would know there's a God. That's God the maker. Who's God in the book of Revelation? Well, he's first of all the creator. He created uh, the Garden of Eden, and he can recreate the Garden of Eden. He created the heavens and earth. He can recreate a new heavens and new earth. He, he created Jerusalem. He can create a new Jerusalem. 
God the creator. The second thing he says is that God is the God of revelation. And I'm not talking about the book of. I'm talking about the process of. What it means is this. God is a God who communicates his will to us. He not only has the right to put his will on us, he tells us what it is. He doesn't leave it to us to subtly divine what he wants us to do. You know, people treat the will of God nowadays like, oh, well, I wish I could figure out what it was. Well, try reading the Bible. Try going to the source book. You know, uh, God's will is that we should pray continually. Uh, let's see, I wonder what God's will is for me in prayer. Well, you know, again, that's not, we make this so complicated. You know, one of the things we've talked about all through the book of Acts, our study, is how simple it is. Just, just go and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And don't, don't do the mailbox thing and the voice in the night and all that kind of stuff. God is a God of revelation. He says, what do they say in this prayer? The second thing they say in verses 25 and 26 is, we knew the persecution was coming because God, clear back in the Old Testament, prophesied that it was going to happen. They, you know, somebody says, I can't believe we're being persecuted. The early disciples understood, well, I, you know, I'm surprised it didn't come sooner. Somebody says, are you amazed that they arrested you? <laughs> Not really. We expected it to happen. Why? Because in one, of the, in one of the greatest messianic psalms in the Old Testament, Psalm 2, right after it says, you are my son, today have I begotten you, right after it says, I shall be to him a father and he shall be to me a son, clearly talking about the divine relationship between Jesus and God, what's the next verse? Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain and the kings of the earth take their stand? The rulers gather together against the Lord and his anointed. What's the next two verses? Now, how can you buy Jesus in verses 1 and 2 and not see him in verses 3 and 4? It, they're right there. And he says, he says, hey, we're not surprised Jesus was put to death. God said the, nation, the kings of the world were going to rise against him. Against who? Against the Lord and his anointed one. Who's the anointed one? Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. Who follows the Messiah? The apostles. The church. It all just fits right together. You see, the same Bible that told them Jesus was the Son of God, the next two verses tell them to expect persecution. Because that's the way God, and by the way, their understanding is if God prophesied it, that means God intended it to happen. That's the way prophecy works. If God says it's going to happen, that's part of his will. And it'll go down that way whether you want it to or not. So look what they say. He says, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Where do they think scripture comes from? The Holy Spirit, right? He spoke through the Holy Spirit to our servant David. And what does he say? Why do the nations rage and all of this? And he says, guess what? Verse 27, it happened just like you said. Because the third thing they understand about God is God's got a history. God controls history. Everyone that Everybody's worried about, you know, and I am too, we're all worried about who's going to be the next president. Right now we're kind of worried about who's going to even be running. It's kind of crazy out there. There's a lot of things being said, a lot of disturbing things on both sides of the, of, the, of the table. Things that are being said that people of faith look at and say, man, I, you know, I, where are we headed? What's going on? But, you know, whoever, whoever ends up in there will be the one God wants in there at that point in time. And when God's done with that person, he'll be gone. Somebody else will be there. She'll be gone. Somebody else will be there. However that goes out. It'll happen the way God intends it to. And you know something? It doesn't change my being a Christian. I'm no less a Christian or, or more a Christian if I live in a free nation or an enslaved nation. If I live under a despot or if I live in a democratic system. If I get the guy I'd like to see or, the, or I don't get the person I'd like to see. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Not in God's scheme of things because God controls the flow. That's why Paul can say all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If you're called in the purpose of God, no matter how bad it seems right now, it's part of the flow. And the biggest thing we need to learn as Christians is to go with the flow because the flow is controlled by God. All you got to do is write it and trust God. And that's the hard part, isn't it? The trust in God is where we get messed up every single time. 
But what do they say? They say, look at verse 27. They quote Psalm 2 that promises persecution, and then the next thing he says, look at verse 27. The first word is indeed. What does indeed mean? And just like he said, guess whose heads popped up? Herod and Pontius Pilate met together. They conspired together with the Gentiles and the Jews to do what? To kill Jesus. And notice they say, Jesus whom you anointed, tied right back to that verse from Psalm 2. The Jesus you anointed, yeah, they persecuted the anointed. That's why we know, he says, that this was part of the prophecy. And then look, if you're not sure what they mean by that, look at verse 28. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. I don't always understand why things happen the way they do. I don't always agree with things happening the way they do. But the first question I need to ask is not, why me? The first question I need to ask is, how does this fit? How is God going to fit this into the flow? Because I believe with all my heart that the day I was born, God mapped my life, and he knows where he wants it to go, and he knows what he wants me to do, and he knows where he wants me to end up, and I don't get it, but I have to trust him. And whatever I do, how, whatever I go through in life, good or bad, I've got to let my faith in God drive me through that. Somehow. And a lot of it's just pure and simple trust. It's, it's just, uh, you can't make it any fancier than that. I can't give you a six-point plan or, a, or a, a, a philosophic treatise on it. You just, sometimes you just have to sit back and trust God and... and and go with it and say somehow God's going to bless me out of this I don't know how but I know he will so I think they had a pretty clear concept of God I think they saw him as the God of creation the God of revelation the God of history the God who makes the God who speaks and the God who does and that's a great God to serve now, there's a third truth that emerges in the last two or three verses of this passage. Believers put their loyalty to one another and to Christ first. They had a clear understanding of who they were working for. And they were direct and specific in their prayers. They got right down to the business. Let's pray about it. Let's pray about what? Lord, bless the church. What does that mean? Lord, look over your people. What does that mean? You know, it's kind of, and I'm not criticizing those that lead prayer. I realize when you lead public prayer, you've got to think in, in more general terms. But I, I, for, as a kid, I listened for years at those who prayed for the sick and afflicted. And I wondered to myself, well, you know, so what does that mean? I mean, if, if the person is sick and they need a ride to the doctor... And I pray to God to bless the sick and afflicted. Does that mean God should kick me in the pants and get me to go take that person to the doctor? You know, I, I kind of scary to think about if God, in specific terms, took our generalized statements and really, really put them on us. We pray for our brethren, wherever they may be, especially those in hard places. What does that mean? Do you know anybody in a hard place? Well, yeah, I know two guys. Then why don't you mention them? Oh, but God knows who they are. Hey, God knows everything. God knows all that stuff. That's not the point. And I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to, to criticize general prayer. I get that. But I don't think as church we, we pray near enough about things that concern us, specific people, situations, problems, individuals. You know, we, we don't. And when we have prayer, you know, it's interesting we, you read about some of the great men and women of faith in, in, in Christian history, and they would pray. You know, Martin Luther began every day with three and a half, four hours of prayer. And, and I'll be honest with you. Are you sitting here like me right now thinking to yourself, what in the world does a guy pray about for four hours? 
I mean, I can get I can get God, Mother, and Country all covered in 30 seconds. I mean, what in the world do you pray about for four hours? Now, nobody's smiling at me, but I bet I just hit everybody. What would you do if we sat down in the assembly one Sunday morning and some fellow rose to lead us in prayer and really got specific and an hour later he was still praying? Half of us would be out the door. Yes? Now yeah, we're not going to say that because it would look bad on us. But I mean, the truth of the matter is we're sitting there thinking, would he please shut? Have you ever done that? Have you, I, I'm, getting real, I'm getting in real trouble here, huh? Have you ever sat there at church, listened to somebody pray on and on and on, thinking to yourself, would you please wrap it up and shut it up? Shut her down, let's get on. We still got two songs on that unending sermon to get through, and I'm never going to get home if you don't shut up that prayer and get on with it. Amen? Mm-hmm. Hey, I've thought it. You have too. We all have. And it tells us, it, it kind of exposes us, doesn't it? It kind of exposes us. They got direct with their prayers, verses 29, 30, and 31. The first thing they did was they asked God to consider their situation. They said, Lord, consider their threats. He doesn't say, Lord, whack them in the head. He doesn't say, Lord, drag them underground and set them on fire. He doesn't say, Lord, cast the judgment of eternity on their heads. There's nothing imprecatory about it. There's nothing ugly about it. They just said, Lord, consider. To consider means to think through or think about something, to analyze. And they said, Lord, Think through these threats they've made. Like God doesn't get it. But I think what they're doing is they're asking God to be aware of and alert to their specific problem right now. God, we've been threatened. We're a little bit intimidated. We're a little bit frightened. But we want to do what's right. Would you please, in your own mind, think with us through what's gone on here? You know, so they're calling God to give specific, intensified attention to this one problem they're having right now. And then what do they do? They say, and give us boldness in teaching. I think what they're thinking here is that maybe they're not quite sure how to go about going ahead and doing what they've already decided they're going to do. They're going to walk in the will of God. They're just kind of, they're just kind of casting about for how can we best do this now? Is there a better way to do this? Is there a more subtle way to do it? Are there ways to do this that won't get, I mean, you know, it's not going to do us any good if we all just get killed. Is there a way we can do this and stay in your will and allow you to deal with the threats? And so what do they say? They say, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That's the same word that's used, by the way, in Hebrews to talk about going before the throne of Christ in boldness or the throne of God to ask for mercy and help because you're going through Jesus. And so there's this idea of going on the offensive. I don't think they ever sat down and had a conversation about, well, listen, why don't we lay low for a couple of months and then we'll, we'll pick it up. Maybe we can start like out in the suburbs somewhere where we aren't quite as direct with these guys. They said, now listen, we're going back to the Temple Mount tomorrow. First thing in the morning about 6 o'clock. Um, what are they really praying for? Aren't they praying that God will take away their fear? That God will take away their timidity. That God will kind of put his foot in their, in their seat and push them on out. And, and don't, let us, don't let us sit back and make excuses because of the heat that's coming down. When's the last time church prayed for that? We always ask for God to bless our efforts. Whatever that means. They said, Lord, make us bold. Fill us with courage. Push us out there. Make us stand on the front edge of the stage. Open that door of opportunity. Lord, Lord, when we go out there in the morning, get us a big crowd together. Because there's people out there still need to know about Jesus. The third thing they ask for God to do is to provide them with signs of support. 
Now, we know that in the first century, signs of support were represented by their ability to perform miraculous signs. In fact, Peter puts it in those terms. Stretch out your hand. By the way, that's interesting. That's what Peter did to help the man up when he was healed. Uh, stretching out your hand is to provide assistance. And that's what they're asking for. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders. How? Through the name of your servant or the name of your holy servant, Jesus, which is where the last miracle went, wasn't it? By whose power did you do this? And what did the apostles say? By the power of Jesus of Nazareth. There's still that clear understanding that it's through the power of the name of Jesus that anything gets done. All they're asking for God to do is to continue his coordinated efforts with them. So that if a healing is needed to authenticate the message, if a healing is needed to cement the deal, if a healing is needed to prove the point, you know, you never hear disciples say, well, Lord, just heal us so that everybody will think we're great. Lord, heal her because she's my aunt. Lord, heal us because the church needs to see people healed in the church. You don't have that. It's, God, we're going to go out and bear witness to your son, Jesus. We're going to be in a hostile environment. People are skeptical at this very early stage. You have demonstrated the fact that you can use miraculous healing power to cement the deal. What got the apostles off in this situation? The miracle. The Sanhedrin leaders said, hey, we can't kill them. They heal this guy, and everybody in town knows it, and they think they're prophets of God. All we can do is just beat them up, send them out, tell them to shut up. And so what did they really ask God to do? Give signs of support. I think the church can still ask for God to show his support in things that we do. We just need to look for those. So what do we learn from this passage? Peter and John come back. They come back to their own folks. They pray together. They call upon this God of creation, revelation, and history to do what? Look at our situation. Bold us in our teaching. Give us support where we need it. Pretty simple. What we're taught is that true Christians are loyal to one another. Did you notice that? Loyal to one another, faithful to their God, and targeted in their praying. That's three things I just kind of walk away with when I look at this passage. They're loyal to each other. You know, you beat up my brother, you're going to have to go through me to get there. You know, you pick on my little sister, you and me going to have a talk after school. Any of you ever done that? Any of you ever, any of you ever took it up for your kin folk? You don't mess with my people. You can do anything you want to me, but don't mess with my people. I think that's exactly the attitude God expects his people to have toward one another. Don't mess with my people. Don't mess with my God. Because he's a great and powerful God. He created us. He sustains us. He guides us through life. He determines our outcome. I'm not going to waver on that. Not going to follow a, a false God. He can't get me there. And in doing that, I always remember, I always need to remember to go to God. Let him know what I need. Let him know what I fear. Let him know how he can help. Now, how I think he can help may not be the way he chooses to help, but by me letting him know what I at least think I need, what am I saying? I'm depending on you, God. Sometimes what he gives you is far better than what you ask for. And so this is a great passage called Handling the Heat. Because we all, we all, we get in the hot spots every now and then, don't we? We find ourselves in the middle of a conflict. We find ourselves on the front lines of a battle for our spiritual lives. And there are times like early Christians when we have to stand up too. Stand up to some pretty influential people. Stand up to some pretty public forces. 
to just march forward and do what's right. But this passage gives us hope because it tells me we're not the only ones that have ever been there and that the same God that got them through it will get us through it too. We just need to simplify. We need to hang on to each other. We need to stay focused on God, and we need to let him know what we need. And if we do that, I think we'll be blessed for what we're doing. Not worry about all that other complicated stuff. It's too complicated. Faith is a simple thing. Faith is a simple thing. Give me your son. Okay. Where and when? Where and when? It's that simple. If you need to respond to him this morning or this afternoon, we're all confused. If you need to uh, make a change in your life, make it. Make it in prayer. Pull somebody aside and say, hey, pray with me. i got to work on this. I need to work on it right now. If you need to become a Christian, let one of us know. We'll do it. We can do it right now. We can take care of it. Not a problem. We'll take you right down to the river. <laughs> no, we won't do that. We won't do that. We do have a baptistry, though, and that will work fine. If you need Christ in your life or if you need renewal in your life, let us know what we can do to help. And to do you, to do you the best service of all, we're going to encourage one another by standing together and singing.